Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Berit Voos. I'm the director of FinTech Solutions at uh, Riddle & Code, and um, I'm very happy to welcome everyone to today's event about digital assets, DeFi and NFTs brought to you by Disrupt and Riddle & Code. Um, we have a really, really packed session today, so we'll move on really quickly. Uh, but before we do that, I just wanted to mention that you can ask all your questions during the event uh, in the chat uh, window, and we'll try to answer as many as possible during the Q&A at the end of the event. Um, so for the very first session today, we're really happy to have a familiar face to these sessions moderate uh, our first fireside chat. Um, so without much further ado, I would like to hand over to uh, Philip Sandler to kick off this event uh, and to introduce um, the first speakers. Philip, um, the floor is yours. Yes, perfect. So let's uh, directly get started uh, into the topic. Um, I would like to quickly present the speakers. I would rather ask uh, to present everybody um, himself quickly. Um, I would also deviate from the agenda a little bit, Alexander, and very, very quickly ask you about your opinion on Bitcoin. You know, did it, did it change or did it not change? You know, the sentiment changed, but the facts did not change. Um, but before we are doing this, maybe everybody, please present yourself quickly and also your background. Sure, and then uh, I will start. Alex Koppel, I'm, I'm the CEO of Ridland Code. Um, uh, my background is I've been working in telecommunications and, and media for some time um, in, in my past career. Um, before I met Tom, the founder of Ridland Code, and uh, I got excited by the opportunity to work with him and found Ridland Code here in Austria. Um, now in the fourth year with Ridland Code and uh, still excited about the opportunity we see in the market. Tom? Okay, yes, so my name is Tom Fürstner. I'm the founder of Real & Code. I uh, was founded four years ago. And uh, the main reason we did it is because we are uh, convinced that it's amazing what you can achieve with distributed ledgers and blockchains concerning digital assets. But uh, our speciality and our niche is to achieve the same things for physical objects. And this bridge between blockchain and the physical world is something we are operating on. Uh, a big scale and uh, the whole the whole way the industry is moving forward these days especially concerning nfts uh, is proving that we are right yes that's about Riddle. i perfectly agree when i think about riddle and code i typically think of uh, sebastian with his iron um, suitcase um, at a conference and there are the chips uh, inside uh, where you basically can can see custody tech in real life, very often custody tech is simply described on PowerPoint slides, you know, like high secure stuff and some and so on. Uh, with Riddle and Code, uh, you can basically touch and see custody tech in forms of the chips. Maybe you quickly describe in a in 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 a second if this impression from me is right. You know, is this Riddle and Code this little chip uh, where you can like write a private key onto, or what I guess so is Riddle and Code much more in terms of an ecosystem around the chip software and so on. So what is Riddle and Code? Is it a chip? Is it more? Is it the ecosystem? Uh, please quickly for everybody describe this okay. as so, providing a background. Yes. So Riddle and Code is a platform and a stack. Uh, uh, it's based uh, around the idea. So you cannot hash physical objects naturally. You cannot do it. You would have to transmute them. Uh, but what you can do is you can bring the blockchain to the physical object by uh, connecting them in a very secure way to so-called crypto accelerators, so small chips, which are specialized and optimized for running all the cryptographic primitives. So at Real and Code, we do really everything. So from FPGAs design, basically ASIC design, yes, to, to driver design, to, to, to developing our own microcontroller boards, uh, and it goes up uh, to cloud services, so and everything in between. So the full stack starting more or less with uh, uh, logical units on an FPGA board up to uh, quite complex setups for uh, multi-server cloud solutions is more or less handled by Redland Code. Perfect. And um, one follow-up question on this. Uh, also, maybe Alexander, you're welcome to reply also here. Is a Riddle and Code um, primarily about crypto exchanges, financial assets, real world assets, industrial assets, cars, machines, and other things? You know, where do you see uh, the, the vision uh, here primarily? And plus, it, it, this is related to a, another question. People very often said, especially from the finance industry, that custody is a commodity 
margins will go down and there is nothing to be earned uh, in custody. This is what people said uh, on their PowerPoint slides a couple of years ago. Uh, I think it's different uh, because custody is like a, a, a key uh, technology because it allows access to all kinds of devices connected to them. Uh, but maybe, uh, Alexander, Tom, uh, what's your perspective uh, on this? Uh, is, is custody, uh, to, to, I repeat the question because it was too long, is custody just for the financial industry or is there much more in it? I know the answer, but I want you to reply if this is okay. I think, Philip, you know, the, the, this, this question is, is, is really, really going into, deep into the philosophy of written code. So I think, let me answer with, with something I learned from, from, you know, my colleagues is like, you know, before, they need, before you need custody, you need to have a digital asset, right? And the question to us is, uh, you know, what's the next step, right? And you, you already, gave the answer in the question. I think we see a lot happening in, in the industrial sector. Tokenization is taking uh, shape and it, it's changing the, the landscape pretty fast in many ways. You know, the way we engage with consumers, the way um, we produce, the way we finance. In all of this, it has, it has a tremendous impact. And I think Tom and I have been thinking about this from the very beginning uh, in, how, in the, the way we sort of set up Ridland Code. So Ridland Code is, active along the value chain, which we see evolving, uh, and it takes its roots in, in the creation of value, right? And uh, without any disrespect to the financial industry, I'm not saying that you know, assets coming out of the financial industry are not of value, on the contrary. But I, I, I think that industrial production, and as Tom uh, mentioned earlier, physical objects and machines are a source of value, um, which are perfectly to be combined with digital assets. And this is, this is what we're focusing on. Now, to your question about custody. I think custody, to, to call custody a commodity is maybe a bit of an exaggeration, right? It's, it's, it's something when people say, ah, I, I don't need custody. You know, it's, it's going to be a commodity and you know, everybody will have it. I tell you, Philip, you know, we, we, we work basically in, 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 in all of Europe, right? And we see a lot, we talk a lot to people. What we see in custody, with all respect, is far from being, you know, optimized, professionalized, and, you know, if you want, standardized, you know. Um, but what we see happening is a lot of pressure coming from the regulatory bodies. You know, the more attractive um, the Bitcoins, as you, as you earlier said, get, and the more um, successful, you know, exchanges get. And to be honest, it's, it's a millennial phenomenon also around digital assets. And so, you know, there, there is a tendency from the regulatory structures to really look at the technology being used. Auditability is a big topic. You know, business rules are a big topic. So um, long story short, um, I don't believe that this is a commodity yet. To become a commodity, there needs to be a standardized demand. You know, then you can create a commodity. The demand is being driven by, you know, unregulated, local markets at the moment and this is going to change first second i think uh, custody will be a function of the product um, product families we will be seeing you know and, and i already now i think every day we talk to exchanges and, and investment companies and family offices and it's very interesting you know what they believe tomorrow will be the demand for custody in terms of their product flexibility so also this will be, you know, pose a challenge to some of the technologies which are being deployed at the moment. Um, and we at Real and Code, we believe that we have a great and flexible technology which allows a very, um, I should say, open-minded approach to the, to the, to the uh, digital assets to come in the near future, right? So flexibility towards demand is, is a big topic. Okay. Um Okay, and where, did, where, do, where are we coming from? You know, in the past, we had trusted organizations such as banks, and they have been mandated by us to custody our assets. You know, you have the bank and their vault. I can put a gold coin in the vault, and the bank uh, is watching it uh, over years such that it's not getting stolen. 
The same is happening with securities and so on. And basically banks have been very good at caring about uh, our stuff. You can always criticize banks for whatever they have been done in the financial crisis. We all know this, but still the, the core value of a bank is basically custodying assets. That's the vault, that's the bank account, that's the brokerage account and so on. I think we can say this, right? But in the future, I would now expect that Custody is basically moving away from banks, as you have said, uh, Alexander, um, that custody is maybe becoming distributed, custody might be spread out in the market, and you can easily see this, that basically we as human beings could do our own custody when we have a USB stick and there might be a fraction on a, of a Bitcoin on it, right? So custody is moved away from the bank and distributed in the economy. Custody could also be distributed towards products, you know, because a car in the future, a machine in the future and other things, we will have tons of examples coming up, um, will do their own custody because they might, because a car needs to maintain a connection to its digital twin, right? Would you agree with this overall trend which is going on? Um, let's call it, I, I don't like this term of, you know, de democratizing a custody, you know, that's that's... That's not so nice, but what I do like is um, that the, the the outreach of custody, the distributing of custody, the dissemination of custody, going away from a few centralized, trustworthy organizations into all kinds of products, things, devices, USB sticks, people, smartphones, and so on. Uh, so this is in my you could even call this a mega trend, right? Um, would you agree here, or is am I exaggerating a little bit? So, so at the end, let, let me answer. Alex. So uh, let's say we have to make a difference between the capability and the possibility of things to happen and the reality, right? So the reality is we have a huge influx of uh, new customers suddenly uh, facing the challenges of dealing with crypto assets and crypto coins. And it's still quite complicated. So most of the, the coins are not held by the individual. They are still held by an exchange maybe by a bank, if the bank is more innovative and already willing to go into crypto assets. But very, very seldom you see people who are really uh, having their coins in self-custody. I mean, there are the, the so-called hardware wallets, which are more or less detached small devices, uh, which are air-gapped against uh, any kind of network to store your, your wells, your crypto wells or your crypto assets. And, and they have sold a, a tremendous amount of it over the last three years. So the two main companies, Tracer and Ledger, each of them sold uh, between four to 16 million devices, which is really uh, uh, amazing. But uh, at the end of the day, we see with all the companies we work with, custody is not an individual thing, it's still an institutional thing. And uh, uh, it changed last year a bit but now with all the new products concerning, you know, DeFi, NFT, and so on, there are not even the tools for people to self-sovereign uh, store their uh, crypto assets. It's really complicated. So especially with DeFi. And if you want to stake or if you want to vote or you have multi-staking processes and so on, you could not do this simply with your mobile phone. Yeah? You can only use an interface offered by an exchange or a similar company. So what you say might be going to happen, yes, but at this point in time, no. I would say that custody is a quite centralized business and run by the big exchanges. Okay, and do you see that uh, this development will change in the future when we have the Internet of Things coming, when, for example, a car or a thing or a robot uh, might uh, be assigned to some kind of NFT token uh, because then it has a digital twin. I think we all know these stories. Is this basically the vision for the next uh, five to 10 years? Because you know what I just had in mind is the following. Think of the internet of things, which is slowly coming. The internet of things will consist of devices, which probably is do, are doing their custody themselves. I cannot imagine the internet of things where all the things are being connected to a couple of banks and then the things are relying on the banks to do financial transactions, you know, sorry, but I cannot really imagine this. I think that all these devices, things, industry 4.0 um, uh, devices should and will do their own custody. Or another example, this might be a little bit off topic, you know, imagine uh, the entire continent of Africa 
you know, in Africa, um, you have partly um, regimes which are not working perfectly, right? You have not perfect institutions as uh, the well-working institutions we have over here in Europe. So people in Africa, they cannot rely on trust, uh, trusted institutions sometimes. So they might, uh, might be forced to do their own custody, right? With their own devices, with their own USB sticks, with their own cell phones and so on. So do you see a larger trend here coming. And Thomas, I, I, I'm, I think I perfectly agree with you. We have always to disentangle what has happened so far and what is currently happening and what will happen. But maybe you can provide um, your, us with a little bit of insights what you think will happen in plus five years from now on uh, in the custody uh, domain. Okay. I mean, yes, it's, um, it's a very valid question. So concerning the industry 4.0 and uh, concerning IoT and AI, IoT, edge computing, all this stuff is, you have to take it from a slightly different angle, right? So uh, it's a trust issue. And we will be surrounded by intelligence networked connected devices uh, within the next 10 years, up to, to billions of them. Yes, it's, it's really uh, uh, incredible what's going to happen concerning this. And we have to trust the devices. So we have to trust that the device is built by a dedicated company, that it does or it's running uh, dedicated routines, that it has a certain ID and that we can trust and rely on the data produced. So how can you address the problem? You address the problem by giving the devices identities. And these identities follow the so-called blockchain address scheme. So you have an identity, which is an address, a blockchain address. So when you have a blockchain address and data and you exchange the data, what you have is settlement, so you have a wallet, right? So it's, it's not far-fetched to say that in the future, every IoT device will be capable to settle data, data transactions and data value transactions automatically uh, uh, via blockchain technology. Therefore, uh, you are spot on when you say, okay, the machines have to be sovereign so that machines can settle transactions with other machines or machines with uh, uh, industrial appliances and so on. Yeah, but still, uh, uh, the, the issue is what does it mean for the institutional uh, uh, trader or the institutional uh, uh, value holder is, is another matter. Yes, it's really undecided. Yeah, I, I, I was so convinced that self-custody would be a big issue already now, and it's simply not. Interesting. Um, maybe, Alexander, would you like to add a point uh, from your perspective? Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, you talked about trust in banks earlier, right? And I would like to add to this um, and to the now, not so much to the future. I think the trust is also very much interconnected with the regulation, right? The, the reason why we have trust in banks is because they're so regulated. And um, I think this is what we're also building on uh, as Riddle and Code. We've always been working very um, intensively with regulators. And you know, it's, I'm really proud to say that since of last week, we are now fully regulated here in Austria and also as a crypto custodian, right? So we, we have achieved regulatory approval. Uh, we are at the moment undergoing an IT audit, um, which is also allowing us to then, you know, present basically to the market also a trust level, right? And I think, you know, this trust level is required if you want to become more than just a, and it, you talked earlier about the commodity custody, you know, if you want to become more than just a technical provider, right? You, we want to be a market maker. We know that there are a lot of steps we need to take to be able to be a trusted market maker. And I think that um, these, these, you know, I, I, I'm really, really uh, optimistic that we will see a lot more of these market moves. And, you know, a lot of what we see happening in Germany is, is making us very confident that these market moves, these market buildings in a trusted way will add to the overall acceptance of you know, what we feel is going to be the next step. You know, the digital assets, which are rooted in industrial production, uh, which are also then driving the demand for such services, whether this be in custody or tokenization issuing or you know, trusted sources of data. Yeah, excellent. Uh, I think this is very interesting. I would like to make a follow-up question. Two years ago, there were multiple companies in the area of start, uh, custody starting their businesses. Some of them relied simply on the tech. Some of them simply relied on the regulatory side that's basically then capable of talking to customers. Some of these ones acquiring a regulation 
are trying to build their own brand. Others are trying to uh, do it in a white label approach, uh, basically selling the tech plus regulation, but not their own brand, right? So you have the tech, you have the regulation, and you have um, the brand. And some people just are purchasing, uh, just selling the tech, some just the regulatory side or both together. And some are also selling their brand, so to say, even if it's a small, tiny brand in comparison to State Street and so on. So you switched, you started as a custody tech provider, if I'm right. And now you're switching uh, towards um, the uh, a regulated entity, like in addition to this as a service. Plus, you also, of course, um, have, a, have a significant brand out there. Of course, you know, you are not a brand like State Street and so on. But in the custody business, uh, people do know you, of course. Is this interpretation right? Because you see multiple companies following different business models on these uh, three dimensions. Did I interpret this uh, correctly? I think what you yes. see is... Right. Sorry, Tom, Alex. No, 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 Alex, please go ahead. No, no, no. Tom, look, you know, I, I think we, we talk about... No, this Alexander, please. Yes. Uh, so, <clears throat> you know, it's, it's, we, we are driven by necessities. So we are deeply rooted into the Swiss uh, financial uh, institutions, yeah, environment. And, and when we started four years ago, so we are already regulated for more than three years uh, uh, by FINMA. Yes, before we got the FMA blessings in Austria, we got the FINMA blessing. And, you know, it's, it's quite interesting to see. So what happened there? So we started out serving, I think, four or five digital coins, yes, uh, to a private bank. It was quite easy. And, and the problem was a simple one. They wanted to have something like multi-signature, and this was only working with Bitcoin, but not with the other coins. Yeah. So it was a technical challenge, and we had to tackle it and to solve it. So already one year into the project, suddenly we had to serve 35 different coins. Yeah, you know, nowadays you have to serve thousands of coins. Uh, it's, it's a complete different thing. And uh, uh, um, um, suddenly you cannot only serve the coins, you have to serve logic. So you need something like business logic or, or policies and so on, and they cannot be written to the blockchain. So, so you have to deal with this kind of logic and business logic, and suddenly your business shifts. So you're not the classical custodian anymore or a classical company delivering custodian solutions, uh, technical solutions. You have to deal with, uh, with business logic and with trading logic and so on. And then you move more and more into the regulated area. Then the things you tokenize or you turn into coins change. So, so you have to be very, very flexible and you cannot clearly define what the custodian is today. It's really not possible because the whole domain is developing with such an incredible speed. Yes, every day you have new cons uh, new institutions you have to deal with, and and uh, what suddenly happens is the regulators learned a lot over the last four years. Yes, so when I compare how we had to justify our endeavor four years ago with what we had to do during the last year to get the regulation um, settled with the FMA, it's 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 incredible. So so the regulators know what's going on now. And, and naturally they start to regulate. And then, you know, we have Mika upcoming. So the European regulation or regulatory framework for everything concerning uh, crypto and crypto and digital assets. And, and uh, therefore um, you have to be flexible and you have to serve different purposes. So a technical one, a financial one, uh, uh, a logical one and, 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 and many, many more things. So this is what drives us. So you are right up to the point that we are driven by the market and the regulator. Yeah, and I would like to follow up on this question of regulation. Do you think the regulator is doing a, a good job, you know, by focusing in Germany on custody rules so far um, or focusing on other things, for example, tokenization in, in Switzerland? Do you think the regulator is doing a good job? Is, is he making it potentially a little bit too hard? You know, people are criticizing the European Commission, including myself, uh, that, the, that the Mika is providing rules that are too tough, which would then potentially lead companies to, to go out of Europe. Um, we never know if this is true right now, we will see in the future. But uh, given that the role of regulation is important, do you, do you think that the regulator is basically doing a good job? Um, is he um, maybe doing uh, the rules a little bit too tough? Uh, is it appropriate? Is it too fast? Is it uh, too... Um, yeah, too slow. What's what would what would you desire? 
think, Philip, to be frank, we, 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 we're following the regulatory environments in you know, Germany, Switzerland, Austria very closely, Luxembourg, of course, Liechtenstein. And um, I think we're not in a position to comment on the work of a regulator, honestly. I think there are so many variables these, these uh, professionals need to take into consideration. Uh, I would like to answer the question in, in a different way. Okay. I can, I, can, I can tell you how tough it is for us to live up to the standards which are required. You know, to, to get a company to a professional level, uh, which is required by the regulatory bodies, is actually not only very costly, but it, it, it really requires a lot of skill and competence, right? So your, your early analysis on the focus of some of the companies is absolutely right, because ultimately, the market and the regulation sometimes only leaves with a limited you know, amount of resource uh, a, a small space. Now we have decided to look at the entire value chain. And so back to your question, I think for us, it, it, it's, it, it is a challenge every day. We keep an eye on the regulatory environment um, with you know, not only FinTech, but also with energy, also in the mobility sector. You know, there's a lot going on and we see this as a core competence of a, of a company to be able to you know, thrive in the future, to understand the, the, the different regulatory environments we live in. Uh, industry-wise and also, um, you know, from a, a country perspective. Okay, so in total, you would say that um, regulatory developments are key to your business. You have to monitor them. You are monitoring uh, them, and uh, this way, uh, you are always, um, yeah, ready to have to adapt here and there according to the regulatory requirements. Also, to our clients, Philip. I mean, you know, our clients—they come to us, and they are big industrial corporations, and they say, "Look, I want to do this. I've understood this. This is this is happening, so I want to get into this." But I, quite frankly, have no clue. So what we what we give them is, if you want, not only the technical value chain and the services, but also we give them advice. We work with them on the product side. Um, this is why we have a strong operation on products team also, and we work with them in shaping the the regulatory framework for you know what they have in mind doing. Okay, perfect. Uh, one of the last questions uh, so far, uh, we already talked a little uh, bit about it, but maybe you can even deepen uh, our un understanding of the role of hardware in all this. You know, you could purchase any random chip out there and somehow embed uh, uh, some kind of private key mechanism. You can do this, but you can also do it in a much more sophistic sophisticated way. So maybe um, why do you think uh, that Riddle and Code has an yeah, excellent variant of the hardware approach and how has this been developed over the last years? Okay, so <clears throat> you cannot just simply take a chip from the market, right? So I know, this would be I great. Know. First, uh, uh, um, first <clears throat> the, the point is you need so-called hardened electronics, yes. Hardened electronics today is, um, how can you say, we know approximately 75 standard uh, attacks against the CPU, yeah? 75. Yeah. So, and uh, uh, when you have a crypto chip, um, more or less, you can also anticipate that these chips are um, protected against the 75 standard uh, uh, attacks. So these are things like, uh, uh, let's say, uh, spoofing, uh, uh, side channel attacks, uh, heating attacks, uh, 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 isotopic uh, um, uh, microscope attacks and Fault injection. Is, I, I could go on and on and on. So you have to buy very dedicated chipsets. This is one thing. Second, the hardened means also that the, the software is quite sophisticated. So to program this takes really a lot of knowledge. Yeah? So it's a very dedicated domain knowledge. It comes from the uh, last 20 years of smart card development, right? So, and there you have the first problem, you have to find people who have the knowledge. <laughs> yeah. Even if you sign NDAs, uh, whatever is necessary, it's really, really, really complicated to find people with this dedicated knowledge about electronics and about cryptography. Yeah. So that's, that's the second hurdle. The third hurdle is the moment you interconnect one secure component with other components, Yes, you, you potentially uh, compromise your own security. So you have to secure a whole system, which is really, really taking a lot of time. So it takes months. Then you have to go, once you have done it, you have to go through rigorous pen testing uh, uh, and, and uh, uh, physical attacks and so on. So the hardware became meanwhile quite sophisticated. The chips became quite sophisticated. 
And the only problem the industry is uh, suffering from is the lack of people with the right domain knowledge on one side, and on the other side, uh, still some NDAs on core components. But this is meanwhile also addressed. I, I, I don't know whether you've heard this. There is a company, it's called Tropical Square, mainly funded by the uh, Tracer founders. Yes, the Satoshi Lab guys. Uh, and they are building out the first uh, secure crypto accel accelerator as an open hardware project, which is really quite exciting. Yeah? So to address exactly this, that we will have uh, secure chips, which are still open source and open hardware. So they can be peer reviewed, everybody can check them and so on. So uh, uh, this is more or less the newest outcome that even these complicated chips are now going to be open source. Yeah, very which was not the case. But, but basically, that you know, um, you have proven very nicely. You know, custody is not a commodity. It's much more complex, and it will grow into a very solid industry in the future. I would guess so. Yes. I I would like to talk um, about machine uh, wallets um, because once the Internet of Things will grow, and we know the numbers. You know, by 2025, there are expected to be 20 billion devices on the planet. That's three times more devices on earth in comparison to people living here. Uh, so it will be huge according to estimates, right? Um, where are we standing um, with regard to machine wallets? You know, has this been already picking up by the industry? You know, what are companies doing like, I don't know, Bosch, Siemens, Daimler, Susan Group, and so on? Are they working in this field already or is it uh, still in PowerPoint mode? Alex? You know, Tom, look, look, please. Okay. so. Uh, I would say, sadly, uh, no, we don't really know uh, another company which is fully dedicated to, to build uh, hardware wallets for machines. Yeah? So um, identity systems and digital twin systems, which are mainly built uh, around the topics of identity. Yeah, this is done by Siemens. This is done by Bosch. This is done by Deutsche Telekom and, and accordingly by other companies of this caliber. Yeah, but to embed a full-fledged hardware wallet, yes, which is really capable to settle any kind of coin transaction, I, 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 we have not met another company really doing this uh, right now. I think uh, we are the only ones who, who have achieved this. So we did it for our famous car wallet, which we built, which we built for the German car industry. Uh, we, we are doing it for utility, uh, utility providers, so for, for energy production. And uh, it works out, uh, I would say, pretty well. Why? Because once the machine has an idea, the machine can settle its own data value transaction, you can also build completely new financial instruments. Yes? So uh, green bonds. Yeah? So you have a full hardware wallet in a smart meter uh, at the industry level. So where you produce the energy itself. Yes, then you can give proof that the energy is indeed green, that it was indeed produced by wind power or solar power. And then you even send it into a, a storage space or a battery, which is also approved by a hardware wallet. So, so you can be 100% uh, assured if you consume this kind of energy, it's green one. You also know the output of this machine over a lifetime. So it's easy to turn it into a green bond. So you take some kind of investment, you input it into this, uh, let's say, plant. You know the, the, the yearly outcome. So you can give an upside on the price on energy. And, and the, the arbitrage, which is created, is then driving the value of the bond. So this is more or less uh, uh, our true goal for our upcoming uh, business models in, in, for the next two to three years. Very nice. Yes, I think this, this area is even hotter than many of the DeFi products right now. Um, so that's, uh, so let, let, me, let me wrap up uh, very quickly because I think we have to move on due to time restrictions. So first of all, um, I, I now perfectly also believe custody is not a commodity. Custody is, moving, custody is moving out of the financial market into other areas. Custody is moving out of trusted organizations uh, into the uh, breadth, I would guess so. And custody can be, uh, from a business perspective, being um, yeah, viewed from the perspective of the tech side, from the regulatory side, and from the business side. Um, and depending on what uh, companies are needing, you have multiple configuration here. And uh, Gridle and Code is uh, moving from the tech side also plus into the regulatory side. I'm very curious uh, when one of your customers or one of you guys will implement one of your custody chips 
into the hand, for example, because this would then be the direct interface uh, to a, a chain. Uh, I've done, I'm not saying that this would make sense actually, uh, but it would be a very interesting experiment. Others uh, are also thinking about, but this is maybe something uh, to do so in the future. I think you want to do a last word, Alexander, to, uh, to close this first part of the conference? No, th thanks very much. You know, it was a great, it, it, I think it was very interesting, you know, to touch upon, you know, the very many topics. Uh, uh, and again, you know, my hope is that we will see digital assets, you know, flourishing, uh, because then there's need for cast custody. And we see the source of digital assets coming from many directions, uh, regulatory being, being one of the, I think, positive drivers um, at the moment. And I'm also, you know, because we, we're based in Vienna, uh, you know, we, we always look to, to Germany and we, we always um, are thankful if the, especially industry, industrial players, uh, you know, start to really give this a big push so we can, uh, in, 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 in the context of global competition, also work with the technology in, in a much scalable, in a more scalable way. Perfect. So, excellent. We have to urgently hand back over uh, to the organizers uh, because we already are a couple of minutes late. Thanks much. It was very, very interesting. Thanks, Philip. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you very much, Philip, for the, as always, most interesting uh, talk about um, digital assets custody. And now we've got to move on to the panel discussion. And uh, I do ha have... Um, the pleasure uh, to actually uh, welcome uh, the most beautiful speakers to talk about this um, this topic. This is uh, on the one hand uh, Uli Spankowski, uh, CDO of Börse Stuttgart, Julian Grigo, uh, Management uh, Director Digital Assets of the Solaris Bank, and Moritz Schild, uh, Chairman at Coinix um, and founder of the Hanseatic Blockchain Institute, and Berit Fuß, uh, who already did the introduction. Um, so yeah, now I can see pretty much everybody. Uh, would be great if you would be able to unmute yourself when you speak. And I want to get right into the discussion with Moritz because Moritz actually is a client uh, or a potential client of custodial services. Um, and um, Moritz, when you look at digital assets custody, what are your most important requirements? Because we're talking now directly from the market. What are you looking for? What are the problems? And who solves it best and why? Yeah, thank you, Sven, and uh, good morning to everybody. Um, great, great pleasure to be to be here. Um, so, so just a brief introduction for those who, who, who don't uh, know me. Coinix is a um, listed entity and we invest in crypto assets. We do um, quite a lot of uh, early stage token investments um, and um, we, we, we even invest into uh, equity in, in existing blockchain uh, startups. And um, when we started, essentially, we um, felt that's most appropriate to start with own custody because um, we are holding our own tokens, so there's no, no requirement to do it externally. And when, when looking at the, first of all, diversity, when we started in 20, back in 2017 and we were investing in quite, quite a significant uh, um, portfolio of altcoins as well, um, and there was no one around from, from our perspective who at an acceptable price level would offer us to, 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 to do the custody for the whole um, um, portfolio of uh, our, our coins. Um, and then with, with uh, the portfolio growing, we, we started to, to, to look into um, potential providers, um, mainly to, to, to do custody for part of our portfolio for the kind of um, deep in the seller part of the portfolio, which we would not uh, need to, 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 to move on a regular basis because initially we felt um, with the providers more and more um, getting, getting into the room um, that usually it takes quite longer time to access coins that are with an external uh, custody provider um, than, than um, having them on your hardware wallet 24 hours uh, available. Um, so, you, so your question about um, the, the main criteria to, to, to pick a, a provider, um, so first, first of all, um, it's, it's security. We have to have a very, very good gut feeling and understanding that the risk of the provider losing uh, the, 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 our, our crypto is 
close to zero. Um, this was one of the most relevant points when doing our initial due diligence on, 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 on providers. And um, mm. that's, that's hard because um, most tend to be relatively open. However, when it really digs down to the details, who has access to which storage device and so on and so on, um, then, then, then many custodians come to a point where they say um, this needs to be kept secret because it's a relevant secret for, for how we do it. Um, and so so we, we found it not too easy to, to do the full technical due diligence. That's the first aspect. Um, then the kind of user experience accessibility, particularly the point um, if you are a small team and when we started, we were three people only. Now we are growing as Phoenix. Um, then you have to have a clear kind of um, a defined, predefined setup, who can do what and how can we replace someone who for whatever reason is not, not, not available to be able in a situation as we had it this week um, to, to, to react quickly and to, to trade coins um, that, you, that you hold. And then of course, it's about uh, 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 cost and it's a little bit about reputation. Um, so we are, of course, looking looking very much um, into who has the um, the German crypto uh, license, for example. And I have to admit, we are not yet clients of Riddle and Code, but we are very open to to look into it. Um, for the time being, we are using Coinbase as our custody um, provider, mainly for the pretty easy reason that they are so huge um, that everybody will understand that they are the market leader in this uh, segment. And um, we tend to go with, with someone who has a huge credibility. Talking about huge credibility, that is like a perfect uh, step for me to uh, address Uli. Um, Uli, what is the Börse Stuttgart doing? How was your day yesterday, uh, first of all? Um, did you cry? Um, and uh, did you have any outages? And uh, what does uh, Börse Stuttgart do to ensure that the uh, custody side of things is working well? And how are you positioned on that side? Yeah, thank you, Sven. Hi, everybody from my side. Um, well, uh, straight to the point, right, Sven? So yesterday, actually, we we had quite a day, I think, not only we, but the whole crypto industry uh, that provides trading infrastructure is uh, has been uh, quite a busy day, has had quite a busy day yesterday. Uh, same for us. Uh, we had no outages. Uh, we focus very much when it comes to the custody side, and this is what we heard before in the, the first talk as well. Um, so you, you have to really find your sweet spot. What is ours? It's twofold. Uh, one is providing like perfect liquidity management for trading on uh, several coins. Um, and the other one is very high secure custody if you are, uh, so to say, on the longer uh, buy and hold um, uh, scenario. And uh, uh, the way we set it up, I think we founded uh, Blocknox, our custodian in 2018. Uh, was pretty much uh, driven by the need and the uh, the necessity to to really understand how everything works in the in the uh, cryptocurrency and and uh, blockchain world. And this is why we decided not to go to third parties like uh, Coinbase or or others. Um, so th the thing uh, is that we we really developed the step by step approach, and now. Obviously, we are um, a German licensed uh, crypto custodian, and uh, we will be adding more and more services that are in the need for uh, trading and custody uh, partners. Um, so adding more coins, uh, adding different types of securities. We onboard uh, institutional players um, at Blocknox, uh, currently in the process of uh, onboarding several uh, banks in Germany. Um, and yet, as, as I said, the main uh, focus is to really provide perfect liquidity management on the trading side, uh, which we focus on. And luckily yesterday, it was tough, but uh, everything worked out. So all good. Everything worked out in the trading sector. Um, well, the trading is connected to it's it, it's 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 a com complete system, right? It's not only trading. I mean, we serve uh, we serve exchanges and we serve um, uh, brokers, and here the usability is quite different. 
on the trading side where you have a multilateral trading book, uh, an order book, it's, it's quite different than having individual brokerage parties um, um, like, like Moritz uh, probably is on the, on the buy and sell side directly. So you need to have a completely different liquidity management for companies like, like Moritz. And, uh, um, and basically we serve those two worlds. So the exchange as we have it on our own, uh, Börse Stuttgart Digital Exchange and our Bison app uh, where we serve Euvax uh, as a brokerage company. Perfect. Um, so um, moving to Julian, how did you kind of like live through yesterday? What did you see? Um, what happened? And how did you actually tackle those challenges? And if I were a client and I could choose between the Blocknox custodian service and the Solaris Bank custody service, what would you pitch? All right. So um, it's not that easy to answer the second question since uh, we are in a close partnership with Bertha Stuttgart, especially uh, Bison and BSDAX. So, so uh, definitely uh, not saying anything bad about our uh, partner here. Uh, but of course, like since I'm working for the last one, I would definitely uh, pitch our solution. Um, uh, but maybe uh, uh, let's start at the beginning. How did we uh, um, come through uh, the day yesterday? I think um, volatility is kind of a feature. In, in the crypto markets, when we're just like not talking about now custody and then security, but about the, the markets, the financials behind it. Um, and this is why it is so interesting. Uh, only through the volatility, I would say, uh, we have a like a, a appreciation of the, of the value of Bitcoin, for example, for, for like 10 thousands of percentages uh, uh, over the last 10 years. And uh, so, so I think it's quite okay <laughs> to have these days. Um, of course, people uh, uh, lose money, uh, but others uh, make money. So it's a fair market. And uh, so therefore, I think it's, it's very interesting. Maybe to zoom out a little bit, um, what are we doing as Lars Bank in this uh, ecosystem and why I'm here invited uh, uh, to this uh, panel, thanks to Sebastian. Um, so the Lars Bank is a banking as a service provider. Uh, we are always in the background. We are white label only working through APIs. And our claim is that every company can offer financial services to, to their clients. You don't have to be a bank. You don't have to be a payment service provider, but still you can offer this service to your end clients. And now when the, when the custody license came in place, which was, I think, in the beginning of 2020, um, um, we thought as the last bank, okay, uh, now there's a, um, a tech product, a little bit similar to what we do in the banking side, only a little bit. We are all uh, familiar with that difference, I think. And second, now there's also a license. So this is exactly how it is on the banking side. So why don't we also build an API for custody for our partners? Because our claim here is uh, any company or every company should and can offer crypto services to everyone. Uh, not by doing it everything on our own, just by partnering with us that's the claim and uh yeah we are happy, happy to drive uh, crypto adoption in the german and european market uh, together with all our uh, competitors and, and maybe one thing uh, relating to what uh, philip uh, said at the beginning on the first session philip said uh, maybe there's not he does not like this word of democratization of of kind of custody and i'm i'm with you uh, philip here on that at the same time um, I think we, we must look at digital assets and then custody as a whole new paradigm. And uh, within this paradigm, there, there's place for a lot of, lot of different niches and, and players. And, and it's so interesting to see um, through uh, the, the recent years, let's say two or three or max four years, the specification of use cases of providers. And uh, yeah, I think that's what makes uh, crypto markets so interesting. And uh, I hope also this panel. Well, yeah, thank you very much, uh, Julian. Um, I don't want to kind of like overlap the time and I will be starting with Barrett um, in the next uh, in the next um, kind of like setup that we do have. Um, but now I want to uh, hand over to the fireside chat with uh, Chris um, and with Jacek. Um, Chris is a COO at Riddle & Code and Jacek is the Senior Regulatory Affairs Advisor at CoinFirm. That's a coin tracking software. And uh, we got to hop off this um, kind of uh, nice chat now again, and we got to see each other at uh, 10.35 again. Yes, hello. Thank you, uh, Sven, for hand have, uh, handing over. Um, my name is Chris Hartmann. I'm the Chief Operating Officer of uh, Riddle and & Code, and uh, we're going to touch a different area of crypto, which is uh, uh, DeFi, Decentralized Finance. 
and uh, the regulatory, uh, respectively, the AML aspect to it. To discuss the topic, I am uh, happy to uh, introduce Jacek Grismiel. I hope I uh, pronounced your name correctly. Uh, Jacek, uh, Jacek uh, um, is um, uh, a renowned expert in the field of AML. Uh, for coin from Jacek, maybe you can shortly introduce yourself uh, and, and explain to us what coin from is actually doing. Yes, uh, thank you, Chris, uh, for this introduction. It's a pleasure to be here. And uh, as a partner of uh, Riddle & Code, uh, I would like to congratulate on the announcement regarding the, the approval uh, in Austria. Um, so um, yes, indeed, I am a advi senior advisor at, uh, for regulatory affairs at CoinFirm and also responsible for business development uh, in the DAC region. Um, I'm really glad to see how the market is developing also from regulatory perspective in Germany in particular and in Switzerland. Having uh, lived and graduated from Humboldt University, it's a real pleasure to see uh, uh, and work with many companies in Germany. Um, so my background is uh, legal compliance from UBS, Royal Bank of Scotland, Citibank, PwC, and now for more than two years at CoinFirm. Uh, CoinFirm uh, is uh, a leading uh, AML provider for crypto assets. Uh, we have a platform SaaS uh, model and service for a variety of different uh, crypto uh, services, including custody, um, exchange, uh, payment services, gateways, uh, and also uh, services from forensic perspective. So we're also involved in some major cases, in, in, including hacking tax, or also working uh, um, on a service basis with source of wealth, source of funds uh, um, analysis. So we're experts in blockchain analysis, and as such, uh, we're happy to support any types of protocols, blockchains, and uh, do monitoring, filtering, and uh, assessment of risk of various players, but also liquidity pools, uh, just to set the bridge to DeFi as well. Okay. Um, Jacek, if you look at the financial industry, it, I have the impression that uh, we are looking at the process of the industry forking into two different areas. One is the traditional financial uh, system with, uh, that is uh, based on intermediates uh, to provide the financial services. On the other hand, we see what we now call uh, DeFi, um, which are services that are based on, on, on ledger, uh, a distributed ledger um, a technology. Um, it, on public permissionless blockchain uh, in a trustless environment where we see financial services offered in a very similar way than we know from the traditional uh, uh, industry. Um, I think what both of these areas have in common is the need to avoid uh, illegal transaction, yeah? anti-money laundering, or even counter-terrorism financing. Now, can you explain in a nutshell, how does actually AML work in crypto? Okay, of course, uh, speaking about it in a nutshell is a huge challenge. I could speak for hours about it. Uh, I think uh, what could be very helpful, uh, I think uh, nobody shared any screens so far, but let me uh, just uh, back up my, my uh, presentation with a, a few screens just to illustrate uh, what the differences are in AML between uh, crypto and fiat. So uh, the, the, if I was to call out one single feature that is crucial when we're talking about AML transaction monitoring or tracing of assets in uh, blockchain, it's transparency versus uh, anonymity. On the one hand, uh, blockchain is very often considered as being uh, anonymous. Of course, this highly depends on the type of protocol. It is different with Bitcoin, Ethereum, or with uh, anonymous types of coins like Monero. The key, uh, however, the key opportunity uh, of blockchain uh, for financial institutions is that it's traceable. Uh, what that, does this mean? So uh, I wanted to illustrate this with this example here. Um, Typically, uh, AML for fiat financial institutions is about uh, monitoring certain transactional behaviors in order to identify risky ones. This can be uh, fully covered with uh, crypto as well. However, the additional uh, uh, possibility is tracing uh, both for destination and source of funds. If we take uh, the example presented here, drag straight, we can see on the bottom of the slide 
it's uh, not a direct exposure. It's uh, the exposure of four hops. It's the exposure of only part of the funds. And even though uh, it's four transactions distance, we can see where the funds were going to. It's a darknet marketplace. This is something that is not present in a traditional finance where you only uh, are limited to the counterparty you're directly interacting with. Of course, there is corresponding banking as well. However, uh, the limit is quite high in this respect. In blockchain, uh, you can uh, literally trace the assets limitless. And uh, that's the huge benefit and the difference. Um, specifically for DeFi, uh, Chris, uh, would you like me to cover well, how this is for DeFi as well? Or Absolutely, it would be actually interesting. This is crypto uh, in general, but I think DeFi has a few specific peculiarities and, and challenges. So what are actually, in your view, and, and, and from the view of a, of a AML company, the biggest hurdles actually, or the biggest challenges that you meet in order to introduce uh, end-to-end EML uh, and counter-terrorist financing regime? Yes. Um, in the DeFi space, um, the main or key uh, difference to centralized uh, VASPs in general, not only exchanges, uh, also uh, uh, liquidity pool providers, uh, any types of, uh, of uh, service providers, is the fact that in centralized uh, model, we have a central uh, entity, typically a legal entity, uh, more and more often also licensed entity and registered entity, and also intermediaries between a buyer and seller. In the centralized exchange, uh, as we all know, uh, there is a buyer, seller, and only a smart contract, a technology, a code uh, between them. Everything is fully automated, and uh, very often uh, there is no central entity uh, that could uh, be taking the responsibility for, uh, among others, uh, also AML and KYC. What this means, what implications it has, there is a lack of global local regulations in this respect. So in March, we've seen a, a new FATF uh, guidance uh, proposal that is subject for comments. I will come to that uh, in a second. Uh, also, Mika is uh, starting to address this. And also, we've seen in US the first uh, state that actually addressed this with a bill uh, and is willing to basically uh, regulate uh, VASPs or regulate DeFi as VASPs, uh, DAO, for example. Yes. Uh, the difficulty, of course, is that DeFi by nature is cross border and cross jurisdictional. So, what this means is how decentralized is really uh, DeFi. Uh, there can be, a, to some extent, a centralized entity in between. Let's take uh, AFE as an example. Uh, and also, what, who should be regulated? For example, according to FATF guidance, uh, developers uh, are not to be seen as VASPs. However, uh, FATF already implies that uh, if the new application or platform uh, is engaged as a business or uh, is uh, somebody that is using it for business purposes, can be considered as VASP. Uh, so this is a very complex and complicated because uh, the question is who should be responsible if at all anyone should be responsible. Um, so let me skip. Uh, of course, there are certain things like data privacy as well, law enforcement implications. Of course, if you want to regulate VASPs, uh, you need to have somebody responsible for SAR suspicious activity reports. Um, however, uh, what we are facing as well, if uh, as long as there is lack of uh, AML solutions or regulation for DeFi, uh, are examples like those here provided. Ether Delta, that was an unprecedented uh, case of uh, penalty or uh, that Ether Delta uh, founders were forced to pay uh, in US. Or KuCoin hack, where uh, um, it's a known fact that KuCoin hackers were laundering the funds mostly through the centralized uh, exchanges. So definitely there is a need. And uh, what we might face uh, without any solution for that will be effectively the risking. Uh, we've seen already rumors uh, from A, for example, to provide uh, liquidity pool services only for institutional regulated uh, uh, entities uh, so that uh, liquidity pools will be limited and reserved only for regulated players. Is that the way forward? Um, so at CoinFirm, we are on the different opinion. Uh, and we implemented actually a solution to address that. Right. Uh, shall I continue? 
Yes, please. I mean, uh, Jacek, uh, there's a lot of uh, specificalities if it comes to DeFi, yeah, and a lot of challenges. And there is two different views. One is mainly driven by the institutional providers. They say, well, actually, we need a full regime of uh, regulatory provisions. Um, you already mentioned Mika, which is marketing crypto assets, which is basically an initiative for European Union to have a single licensing regime across all European countries. Others say, but well, actually, if you want to use the same regulatory frameworks and put it onto DeFi, you basically you kill uh, uh, innovation, you kill the decentralized approach. Um, at the end, uh, I think uh, we heard from the panel before, it's all about security. Yeah? Uh, because if the money is gone, then the question arises, who done it? Yeah? Somebody has to be responsible. So my question to you, do you believe actually uh, that we see a trend towards applying the same regulatory regime that we know from the financial service onto DeFi or onto crypto? Well, uh, clearly uh, we see some uh, developments in this respect. Uh, as already mentioned, the FATF guidance uh, implies that uh, it's not a clear distinction between what can be considered as VASP and what not in the DeFi space. Um, clearly, um, setting uh, different uh, requirements in different jurisdictions would be another problem. As mentioned before, uh, DeFi by nature, by its nature, is um, multi-jurisdictional. Uh, even if we see uh, some further developments in only specific jurisdictions, if uh, we're talking about DeFi accessible to everyone, um, you, need to, you would need to simply comply also with the additional requirements in those jurisdictions. If we have a situation similar to the one that we have currently with the travel rule, where in order to provide a scalable solution, you need to be interoperable uh, and also adhere to regulations in other countries, then def uh, definitely this will be a huge barrier. Um, an example of Switzerland with travel rule specifically. Uh, so uh, we have a jurisdiction that implemented travel rule. However, this is limited to one jurisdiction only. So if we want to regulate DeFi, this should be then global, cross the jurisdictional, and also uh, possible to implement from technical perspective. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, especially the aspect of uh, uh, inter-country and, and inter-jurisdictional uh, regimes. Uh, will be a hurdle or could be a hurdle. So some uh, come up with ideas more saying, actually, since DeFi is eventually relying on synthetic contracts yeah, that are secured by cryptography and blockchain, um, isn't it all about uh, the standardization of um, forensic methods to track uh, services based on, for example, AML? Yeah? So uh, there is a, a provocative question that arises to say, well, if I rely on the self-regulatory um, uh, procedures within such a, a network, shouldn't we at least regulate uh, the ones, uh, the forensic companies like CoinFirm to have a standardized uh, way and, and process to track transactions? Is that uh, something that you are familiar with? Uh, is that something that you can see in the future? Well, uh, this is definitely something that uh, we would support. Um, at the moment, uh, in the last, basically in the last five years, uh, since companies like CoinFirm started uh, proposing solutions to the market, uh, we've been in a constant uh, discussion with regulators and also including directly FATF. Uh, this is a very uh, new technology to everyone, especially with compliance. It's nothing new, right? So uh, the criminals were always a little bit ahead of, uh, of the regulations and uh, the regulators had always to catch up with uh, different ways of laundering money. Now what they need to catch up with as well is uh, new technology developments. Mm -hmm. in, in, in this situation, of course, there is a big responsibility of uh, companies like CoinFirm uh, to set uh, proposals for standards, set uh, different uh, ways of approaching uh, the difficulties that we face, and this is exactly what we uh, are proposing right now for uh, for DeFi and are consulting with the regulators. I would like to show you very quickly. So uh, for the DeFi, what we propose is uh, Oracle, which is an embedded solution into uh, smart contracts. 
uh, that uh, is automating because basically what I showed before, the lack of legal entity uh, enforces or requires an automated solution, at least to a large extent. So what we deployed is an Oracle that we are discussing also with the regulators as well as protocol issuers. Uh, most recently, we implemented this on RSK uh, SOC. Uh, so uh, the first and second level of uh, AML, first being automated, fully embedded into the uh, DeFi uh, operations. And the second, of course, in addition to that, uh, being the possibility of evaluating addresses uh, once a uh, high risk has been triggered. At the same time, uh, transactions can be blocked automatically if they are related, for example, to sanctions. I think everyone would agree, uh, DeFi, whether it should be regulated and to what extent, it should not allow access to sanctioned entities or terrorism, for example. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. well, thank you, Jacek, for these really interesting insights uh, from an expert of AML. Um, I think we ran out of time now and um, we were all excited to see what the future will bring and where the industry is heading. Uh, I will hand over to Sven again. He will moderate the second part of custody uh, asset of digital asset custody and will, he will take a look at the operational view and the status quo of custody. Sven, your stage. Uh, by the way, you really look like a Formula One moderator, so we ex expect a speedy discussion. <laughs> All right, I'll, I'll just speed up my, my talking like eight <laughs> times or so. Uh, thank you very much, Chris. Um, uh, I really like um, to start with uh, Barrett this time, uh, the, the girl in the round, um, because she is trying to go to financial institutions and to sell the uh, Riddle and Code um, infrastructure. And um, being a consultant myself, I did see, uh, or I do see a tremendous, it's like a fundamental shift of the, of the talks that I'm having. Um, and I kind of wanna, wanna stretch that uh, to Barrett uh, as well. Barrett, did the, um, did the conversations with traditional finance, did they change and how did they change in the last couple of uh, months or years? Um, thanks, uh, Sven. I think uh, I think there's a lot of lot of things to say there, and and uh, in general, I think there's a couple of um, things that have changed in, in the market in general that, of course, changes the dynamics of the discussions that that we're having. Um, you know, first of all, I think that there is a lot more attention to, but also understanding of the importance, but also the complexity of of custody when it comes to to crypto and digital assets. So that kind of already changes our conversation um, because it changes um, expectations and the type of questions that you're getting and, and the type of problems you're, you're asked to solve. Um, besides that, we've also seen in the past, let's say two years, a lot more um, uh, attention, but also action uh, on the regulatory front. Um, again, that, that changes, uh, changes the discussion and it also changes the type of companies that we're talking to because more and more um, is literally allowed and more types of uh, financial institutions um, are interested in, in entering this, uh, this space. So that also really um, uh, changes the dynamics for us. And then, and then finally, with um, a lot of these new uh, products, protocols and opportunities arising, uh, DeFi just being one of them, I think it's becoming more and more of an ecosystem. It's not just one product, one service, uh, and that needs you know secure custody underneath. But there are a lot of different players um, um, in the industry that need to connect to each other, um, and um, um, we also see that in, in terms of the type of questions that that we're getting. And now, if I'm if I'm looking at um, the financial institutions that we're talking to, so as you know, we we both uh, work with more traditional financial institutions as well as with with crypto service providers. Um, and uh, one of the things that really changed uh, the conversation is the fact that uh, institutional investors are entering the market. Um, by no means all of them are, are entering the market yet. I think that there's still um, a wave to come. Um, but the fact that this interest, in, interest has been peaked um, um, changes the requirements. Um, and it, it also changes the requirements of some of our customers who are crypto exchanges and want to offer services to institutional investors. Um, it also changes the fact that we have conversations with them directly and you know they need to run their processes and and, and services in a very specific way and they need solutions that help them help them do that um, so for us you know it, it 
offering products and services to these customers has always been a balance between security, I mean, never compromising security, but also making operational processes uh, easier and, 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 and better controlled. And then finally, let's say um, other financial institutions such as, such as banks and, and, and stock exchanges um, are kind of getting into, into the action as well. I think there's a small part of these uh, institutions who are interested in, in, in crypto and providing crypto services. At the moment, I would say there's even a smaller part uh, of them who are interested in, in tokenization, tokenizing a uh, tokenization of, of digital financial assets. But I do really think that this is a growing, uh, a growing area. And, and for this, for me, actually, the conversations are very interesting because I don't start the conversation with, hey, we need a custody solution. Uh, I start the conversation with, hey, we want to create a digital asset. Um, and only then um, they also need a custody solution. So. Um, there's a lot of things that we have to pay attention to. Um, there's a lot of um, expectations that have, have grown uh, and, and, and really try to create a product that is standard by all means and easy to use, but that can cater to, um, let's say, the challenges of a large variety of customers. Perfect. Thanks for that. I uh, kind of want to uh, move on to Uli um, and, and kind of like test the waters if he sees the same, the same kind of like the shift from a a lot of talking to actually doing something uh, and I want him to share the most um, awkward moment that he had with a traditional financial institution. I will pass this on to Julian as well so he can think about that a little longer than Uli can. That's not fair. <laughs> you yeah. can manage. Uh, well, let me put it that way. So I think from the operational perspective, I think we've learned quite substantially a lot over the last uh, uh, years in the in the complete industry. And I don't really mean that only uh, with regards to our own custody solution. I think uh, the requirements that are being set by the industry have tremendously changed since um, institutional players like uh, banks, traditional banks or other financial institutions are aiming to enter that market. So um, I think uh, custody, when it comes to the combination of operability and security, um, is really something that, uh, well, needed to, to be improved quite substantially. And uh, also we did quite some learning curve and uh, some awkward moments uh, uh, from, from talks with customers. Uh, well, I don't, I, 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 honestly, it's really tough to give, to, to give examples here. It's, it's more... I wouldn't really call this awkward. I think it's just a lack of um, connection to the, the crypto space itself. So um, financial institutions on the classical side tend to think of, of how things work, how they have been working the past 30 years. And now having a decentralized system <laughs> with completely different parties interacting there <clears throat> give you the opportunity to really do things differently. What they want to have is the things need to work exactly like they worked in the past 30 years and you need to make them understand, look, yes, we can do it that way, but we could also do it differently. And then you have uh, obviously a lot of discussions, particularly then when it comes to um, areas like legal and compliance, um, because Technically, a lot of different things are possible. On the legal and compliance side, financial institutions are bound to the rules and regulation that they are, and they're not really flexible. We heard that in the talk with, uh, or in the questions that, that Philip was raising. So what are the regulators, uh, how are they improving the, the system? In Germany, we are somehow, we were somehow behind now. We, we just uh, passed a, a new law for electronic, um, uh, stocks and uh, sorry, not stocks for uh, electronic digital assets. Um, so uh, I think that's that's actually the the most critical part um, when it comes to the awkward situations to talk to the clients and say, look, we can do it differently, but they don't really want to have it differently. They just, you know, I want to do crypto in my old-fashioned way, and that's uh, when it's hard to become creative to, to bring those two worlds together. 
Uh, Julian, Sven, I you don't know if I'm, oh, if I'm allowed to, to sure. jump in on, on this, but uh, you know, I, I, I completely agree. And I think, um, so I have a background in, in banking. I, I, I come from, from that area and um, I really recognize this as a dynamic as well. And what for me, the interesting thing there is, is that these conversations kind of have to go back to the underlying you know, risks and challenges that we want to prevent or mitigate or, or you know, at least monitor and, 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 and control um, in, in such a way that it allows us really to redesign um, how the solution works, but not necessarily redesign what the solution should enable or, or prevent. And um, for me, that's, that's really interesting. Uh, to do um, because I, I was in that world for 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 quite a few years and that was the way I had to work as well um, and 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 uh, yeah now you have that opportunity to to try and change that around but obviously um, that is very much a joint process um, that um, you know that we also go through with with these institutions. Well, that was I, very I, I think if, if I had the, I'm sorry. Um, sorry. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's uh, I just like because I had so such a wonderful time to think about two anecdotes. I have one. Uh, I have two now for you. The one is uh, like uh, old bank is about thinking about crypto. The one is uh, putting Bitcoin into uh, ISIN, uh, like International Security Identification Number or German VKN. Uh, that's the one thing, and just like not to change anything in the front end. And the second is stop trading during the weekends because we cannot settle. <laughs> so <laughs> these things are really kind of showing how how like traditional mindsets can can um, somehow misuse the potential of uh, this new technology and that's what, exactly what I mean with the new paradigm and um, and and uh, and then there's something something in between let's say you want to enable crypto trading during the weekends like as everyone does and, and should do then you still have some other problems because how do you settle fiat 24 7 all uh, on the weekends on bank holidays uh, in the night to Sunday to a.m. Uh, how do you do that so um, this brings a, a, another set of problems now a little bit uh, far away from custody now but um, I'm talking about making use of crypto making use of uh, um, um, custody you also have to think about this fiat to crypto gateway and um, this is why we on our side uh, use uh, our capabilities as a bank to also do this brokerage business and um, and yeah I think these two anecdotes together with the settlement uh, problem on the weekends with why there are for example in the last uh, couple of um, month on the weekend there were quite some troughs in the over the weekend in in ether and, and bitcoin trading this was mainly due to the lack of a settlement of fiat settlement side of of the crypto trades which is very interesting i think and there we can again see that this whole infrastructure of the market has to be transformed and there will be an overlap right and it will not be kind of today we have securities tomorrow there will be digital assets no there will be a long long overlap and during this overlap that um, the market infrastructure will evolve more into to this decentralized 24 7 trading and i think it's it's so interesting to to be part of that and and drive this change moritz, moritz you wanted to jump in go ahead um, I, I just wanted to 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 to, to quickly um elaborate on, on on what barrett said because um if you look into the ewtg the um uh, new draft for a law on on digital uh, securities um, then it gives you a clear view that even the regulator has not yet digged into the system. So they require that uh, each and every digital asset needs to have an issuer, which in a decentralized world, there is no, not necessarily an issuer of, uh, of a, a, a digital security um, like, like the Bitcoin and others. And, and, and secondly, so there's always this old school requirement of setting up a prospectus. And um, if you understand that everything is digital and it's much more relevant to look directly into the smart contract instead of having a lawyer describing what is likely to be part of the smart contract, then it, it, it really very much shows you that these the new processes that are possible um, will not be regulated within the next five years in an uh, adequate and, and appropriate way. Um, that's a very interesting, and I, I kind of want to want to nag on this a little bit because you, uh, Moritz, um, touched upon a I think very 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 interesting topic um, by bringing um, the smart contracts into play. Um, 
because um, and that also kind of like shifts our um, our um, conversation a little bit um, now into the uh, Q and A that will be following up afterwards because we are talking also about the uh, decentralized finance stuff and why does decentralized finance stuff work? It works because of the smart contracts. So um, if you were to custody a, um, a digital asset or digital security, and I think I want to go uh, with Julian on this question, uh, and then uh, Uli has a little bit more time to answer that and I will finish off with uh, Barrett at this one. Um, so if you are keeping custody of let's say a um, digital asset that is a, a token representing let's say a, a house, a physical a physical house um, and you have an ERC20 uh, token standard that is custodied within your solution, do you look in the um, smart contract at all, Julian? Yeah, I mean, um, the, the smart contract is very crucial to to, to be vetted because um, there can, for example, be a, a burning or a minting uh, um, a mechanism built into that by the issuer, by the technical issuer and deployer of this, this uh, uh, smart contract. And if you do, for example, custody of this um, and as a regulated entity and kind of safe key values, for example, the, in your example, the house, uh, and this can just be burned, <laughs> and then you have a problem. So uh, as a custodian looking into uh, um, the smart contract, just as in, in pure DeFi, where we could see like the DAO hack and and um, things like uh, in DeFi at, at the beginning of year in finance, there was a hack in, in, in late summer 2020. Um, betting the smart contract is very, very crucial, especially if you're a regulated custodian and, and there are real values and there are people trusting and trusting you with their values they store with you. Uh, so so uh, definitely a, a big, big thing. And this is also, I think, uh, now um, the, the combining kind of DeFi on the one hand, which is kind of this new evolving, very, very very vibrant ecosystem which is really uh, uh, only like very very lightly regulated if at all maybe super uh, um, advised by by coin firm and chain analysis and so on but not really regulated and on the other side you have now real assets real world assets that are regulated when you have a smart contract kind of tokenization of real estate and there's usually a security behind that a contract behind it that applies to german law or european law whatsoever and like combining these worlds i think there is uh, like we are not seeing that now and we will only see that in a few years because this is again it comes down to this ecosystem development from law from law firms who have to be experts on that from a regulation that has to be adjusted to it and all this and when this grows together then we can see maybe uh, um, tokenizing my my uh, plane, uh, putting it into Aave and land uh, USDC against it. That would be very very interesting, <laughs> but but we are not there yet. Yeah, Sven, is it me next? Well, obviously I can just quickly answer. Yes, you have to look into it. Uh, just from the blame perspective, that from a regulatory perspective, uh, uh, you have to make sure that uh, the things, the tokens that you are actually taking into custody, you are allowed to take them into custody and do exactly that uh, with the license uh, that you are provided by the regulator. So apparently um, uh, safeguarding uh, ERC-20 tokens, technically it's not an issue at all for probably most of the companies uh, out there, but uh, having the appropriate license to uh, safeguard and, and, and have custody for security tokens, at least in Germany or well, is, is some kind of an issue as you probably will not be able to do that with the crypto custodian license. So you need to have a thorough analysis on whether you can really do that also from a regulatory perspective. Same with your car. Probably most of our cars go more than 50 kilometers per hour. However, in the city, you're not allowed to go faster. So same thing. Erit, do you have smart contract auditors sitting at Riddle & Coke? Uh, I don't. I don't have any in my team at this point in time. No, but um, you know, I, I do think that, that let's say a couple of things are, are very important for us. So I think the first thing that's important to understand is that we're a provider of self custody technology, right? So our customers are, are usually the the companies that hold the, the licenses, the financial licenses around the assets. So that is one thing that doesn't hit us dire directly, but of course, it's something we work on together with our customers. But you know. From the perspective of a technical custody solution, I think a couple of things are important. So first of all, first thing has to do with the token design. And, and I think this is also what, what Julian hinted at, um, understanding 
how a token behaves, um, who has access to a token, um, and kind of figuring out if, if these behaviors are restrictions, that it can be a restriction to trade a certain token for a certain amount of time. If that is solved by the smart contract, or if there is something that you would want to or need to solve within the custody part of uh, the solution as well. So that is definitely something to, um, to look at. Um, this becomes especially relevant for us when we do both, let's say, the tokenization uh, project as well as providing the custody solution. Then things have obviously become infinitely easier. I think a second part that, that's important to take into account that's less directly related to custody, um, but it has to do um, with, for example, with counterparties in, in decentralized finance. Um, this is also why you know we wanted to invite coin from here today um where you know with a crypto transaction it it might be a little bit easier to identify the, the counterparty and, and fulfill your duties when it comes to anti-money laundering and monitoring of transactions when you when you participate in in, in DeFi uh, products or uh, participate in liquidity pools um that is slightly more difficult to do and then then i'm that i think that's a, an understatement um but but it's definitely something to take into account and for us very important to make sure that we integrate with service providers who can actually tackle these issues because we work with regulated ent entities and then the final thing that for us is the most interesting of course is that if these tokens um, uh, relate to real world assets whether that is a house or a car or a machine or whatever i think this is really um, at the area where riddling code plays and wants to play a significant role kind of going back to the chat with alex and tom at the beginning where you know we give identity secure identities to objects and machines to make sure that there is let's say a, a very strong link between a digital asset um, and the real world as well. And I think this is very important to um, you know, ensure that digital assets um, um, have a value, that that value can be verified, um, you know, that it still exists, that that car hasn't been you know, totaled or you know, anything that would have an impact on, on the value of a digital asset. So establishing a very strong link there, um, especially going forward where um, you will see more tokenization of, of say non-financial assets or indirectly financial assets, um, this will this will play a huge role. And, and this is definitely what we're focusing on um, with the with Relinko to, to solve. Perfect. Thank you for that. Um, and now I kind of want to open up for the uh, Q&A session. Um, so we ran like five minutes over the time, but I uh, wanted to give the, uh, the opportunity to everybody to kind of get into uh, the game. So um, if all of the other participants would just kind of uh, share their uh, videos and unmute themselves so we can dig right, uh, right into that. I actually um, have written down the questions that came in, um, uh, but I kind of want to start with the, with the last one because I think that's an, uh, that's an interesting one. Um, because it was asked uh, asked what um, would the uh, international ecosystem need uh, to continue to make this happen more for other assets and it was referred to the purchase of the Sun Regis and Aspen um, which was purchased through crypto and blockchain assets um, so what what would we need on a uh, on an international scale um, what do you what do you guys think and who wants to tackle that this is going to be challenging because you're so many people now in the call. If nobody steps in, I'm pointing one out. Yeah, as, so I can I can uh, try to, to just give you one example. Uh, with the German custody uh, license, we are um, um, and able to actively market this uh, um, product and the custody um, to the German market. Uh, we uh, will not be able to do that uh, across Europe to end customers. Uh, we may be, uh, again, uh, able to do that to businesses. Uh, and then there you have this kind of reverse solicitation. If they find you, then you can work with them, but you cannot actively market it in, in for example, Spain. And um, this is just like one, one tiny thing uh, on, on um, how, what uh, 
um, challenges there will be. Um, then uh, what Uli said, you can only, uh, it's kind of like having a fast car, but you are still in, in the, uh, in, within a, in a um, city, uh, um, and then you can still only drive 50 kilometers uh, per hour. It is, uh, we, we are capable of doing that, but there are a lot of legal uh, um, limitations to this. And then uh, you have this, uh, I don't know the English expression for that, but Grundbucheintrag, where, where for example, um, um, the ownership of, of, for example, a house um, is, is written down. And if you just get, kind of send the token somewhere, will this also, also automatically be changed there? Not yet. So you may have to change this as well. And, uh, and, and these are just like three things that pop out of my head. There are potentially 15 more. And, and I, I would say most of them are probably on the re regulatory and legal side. Um, yeah, that's my, my first take on that. Uh, anyone wants that here? I think one of the relevant issues is, is, is really that the, that, that, the, that the nations still try to find a national regulation for the crypto market. And this is not, not appropriate um, for, for kind of the scale it has. And I think um, so, so I appreciate what on, on EU level is kind of slowly developing, but ultimately there needs to be a rule saying if someone wants to promote crypto investments, the following criteria has to be fulfilled on an international scale. So e.g. the smart, the underlying smart contracts need to be made available and um, it has to be an address somewhere. And as, as soon as you start saying, yeah, you need to have a Niederlegungsstelle or a representative in Germany, um, then it gets again into this kind of small minded short club view, um, which, which will result in so many difficulties and in, in, in rolling out something on a global scale. And one, one additional remark from my point of view, I think um, as long as there is no regulation, then there's so much potential for self-regulation. And what we have seen with, with many exchanges somewhere in the world, there are quite a few players that, that want to be the white sheep in this market. And they proactively define certain rules and standards, even though there's no rec regulator requiring that. And I think th that should be an approach for, for all people that want to have this market grow to, to, to cooperate on a, on a multilateral and, and an international level to, to define kind of self-setting standards. I think you touch a very good point here, uh, Moritz. Um, yeah, well, and I mean, we've not talked about this before, but um, actually, when when Germany and the, and the German regulator actually introduced the um, cryptocurrency license, the whole crypto and blockchain world just went crazy and said, "Well, this is all nuts, and this is all not good," and and so on and so forth. But actually, and and I I kind of stood there with with a little candle and saying, "Hey, this might be even good." And everybody was kind of like bashing me and saying, "No, this is not good for the industry." But what actually happens is, um, it's it's very easy. It won't go unregulated. That's a full stop thing. It won't go unregulated. And everybody who wants to be regulated and is going into the German market can be uh, pretty, um, pretty sure that uh, the German license in the process of turning from the uh, German license to the uh, European approach will be passportable. And I think that's something that um, all the German players are playing on, which is a, a, a great uh, field, uh, I'd say. But um, now, um, and, and in contrast to that, um, and that's the reason why I kind of wanted to, to push it in that direction. Uh, Ray um, said, um, like very early on in the um, in, in the conversation, uh, cryptocurrency was created to remove or bypass uh, the middleman altogether. Why would we want to take a step backwards by pushing crypto back towards centralized custodians and financial institutions? So free the world versus financial institutions. Um, I can't think of anyone better answering that than Uli. Go for it. <laughs> uh, um, when I started uh, with what we did here at Börse Stuttgart on the digital agenda in 2017, I went to a lot of blockchain conferences and everyone was asking me, so what's your biggest pain point with Bitcoin and what's your biggest pain point with crypto? 
and uh, mainly with Bitcoin. And then everybody was hinting to some technical issues on the scalability of the system. And they were all pretty surprised when I told them, I think my, the biggest issue that I have with Bitcoin is that nobody really cares about it. And then everybody was shocked. It's like, oh, what are you saying? It's so awesome. And I was telling, yeah, it is awesome. I also think it's awesome. But honestly, it's a very, very small fraction of our population that even understands and knows what it is. So if you really want to change that, you need to make it mass marketable. And if you want to make it mass marketable, you need to have a lot of that, which is creating the complexity of the system, take it away and have intermediaries taking over parts of that. Be careful. I, I'm not saying taking away the keys of the people, but eliminating the complexity on a lot of these points that people can access and have access to this type of assets and then educate them on how they can use it and extract them on their own. For instance, with companies like Riddle and & Code. And regulation i would stand there with my candle next to you and i was always standing there next to you uh, saying hey this really helps us because it brings the whole thing to a completely new system look at all the financial institutions that are now interested to provide this to their clients to their b2c b2b clients so everybody's talking about bitcoin and crypto now so i think uh, regulation did quite some 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 good in that perspective um yeah but Obviously, now I also think uh, that particularly when it comes to Bitcoin, the success of Bitcoin is probably also the biggest uh, problem. As soon as Bitcoin becomes to a stable kind of currency like uh, global payment method, then I think uh, the national sovereignty of uh, countries uh, will be questioned. And I think at least then we will have some discussions on uh, how uh, Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies are have to be regulated, and I'm a little afraid of that. Well, that's an interesting point. I start getting more and more afraid too, uh, but let's see how this pans out. I want to uh, get one to uh, over to Chris um, because I have a feeling that Chris is uh, kind of like more on the let's decentralize things uh, side of the world and, and not too much on this, yeah, let's regulate everything. Um, and um, there was a question um, that uh, somebody posted in the chat um, where he said um, that the uh, traditional industry is destined uh, more to be a participant rather than sitting in the driver's seat how would you say that or how how do you feel about that um i think i'm a, a strong advocate uh, of regulation but in the wider scheme meaning i'm not talking exactly to take the same regulatory uh, provisions and put it onto crypto but i'm saying it will need rules uh, uh, that we can rely on yeah and whether these rules are presented and secured by synthetic contracts, smart contracts, as Julian pointed out, um, is another question. And to what extent can I actually trust these contracts? Yeah, uh, I think technology will help uh, to uh, secure these contracts. But on the other hand, it doesn't solve one problem. Yeah, um, In a fully decentralized uh, world where everybody uh, is his own custodian, yeah, manages his own coins, yeah? there will still be an uh, illegal transaction in terms of money loading. Yeah? So like uh, a shady money in and take it into uh, different um, channels. This is something that has nothing to do whether it's decentralized or centralized. It's just how do you actually prevent it? And I'm very much uh, convinced that especially for this aspect of, uh, of the industry, we will need, again, rules, procedures, uh, and, and even across countries and, and legislations. Anybody wants to add to that? Maybe Berit? Um, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, if it's, if it's about, you know, participant or, or in the driver's seat, I think that's, it, it's a little bit of a black and white way to, to, to put things. Um, um, I think we have different industries and different companies and, uh, you know, everyone is operating in, in their industry and in their niche. And I think for, for crypto, um, that, that will be the same. I think 
that um, yes, decentralization is bringing a lot in terms of, of uh, access, uh, participation, um, 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 security also sometimes if, if, if implemented correctly. However, um, it's also a mere fact that sometimes a central party with a lot of uh, you know, resources can create and bring about an innovation really quickly. And the question is a bit, do we want to completely prevent that or do we want to you know, allow that, make use of these innovations, but without you know, um, uh, making that inaccessible to others uh, to innovate as well. And I think one of the things, this kind of also going back to one of the, one of the previous questions, um, um, that, that I find quite interesting uh, is, so if we want to tokenize more uh, assets, real world assets, financial assets, I, I really don't, don't, don't care. Um, one of the things that I think are still needed a lot more um, are marketplaces. Uh, and uh, right now, marketplaces are sometimes restricted to, to a certain country. Um, some marketplaces uh, feel that they have a very high cost to add and, and list assets. But ultimately, just because you digitize um, an asset or tokenize an asset doesn't suddenly make it a lot more valuable. And it's maybe a bit odd to say in, in the light of you know, the prices some, of, some NFTs have been sold for in, in the recent months. But in principle, just tokenizing an asset doesn't make it more valuable you need to um, make sure that there's a market for the asset. You probably want to have a marketplace that allows a broader access also to that asset than it, it would have, you know, if it, if it was just a physical asset. So I think these are things that still need to be solved. And we all know that, that the marketplaces in this world that are successful um, are the ones that have a certain level of economies of scale. Um, so there is always some advantage to centralizing, um, you know, knowledge or, or, or expertise or, or bringing together a big group of buyers and, and sellers. Um, and, and that doesn't mean that the technical infrastructure un underneath it cannot be decentralized. Don't, don't get me wrong, but um, ultimately bringing together parties around an asset is what, what makes it more valuable. And, and then finally, um, um, also pointing towards coin firm a bit, um, some processes um, are very difficult, right, uh, in, in figuring out whether transactions are shady, whether counterparties are, um, um, you know, on, on blacklists. Um, so this is a type of centralization of knowledge. And I think that makes sense because not every single person or every single company in this world can build up the expertise to do that type of analytics. So let's find let's a, a, a road in the middle um, that um, um, let's say gives way to the ideals that is behind cryptocurrencies, which is just an ex a global market, an accessible market for everyone. But let's not you know just uh, create a complete wild wild west where there is no consumer protection, where there is no way to figure out if anything is happening on those networks that together we don't want. Um, so for me. That's a that's a balance that somehow we need to find to solve together. All right, perfect. I think um, looking at the time, I give room to kind of like one more closing statement before thanking everybody for participating. Is there anybody who wants to add on that? Yeah, I have one idea when it comes to this intermediation and and trust. Um, um, so let's say we have this perfect trustless ecosystem that's settling funds all over the globe. Everybody can interact with that. Still, you need to somehow educate society on that. So somehow the gateway into this ecosystem must be trusted, either because you understand the technology behind it, or if not, you trust someone being the bridge into this ecosystem. And of course, like everyone like should have its Ledger Nano or, or maybe Riddle and Code device or, or whatsoever, right? But um, th that would be a perfect world, but we are not living in a perfect world. There have been many uh, experiments in the past uh, where it was shown that maybe a superior system does not work because people are not used to it and people cannot interact with that without any, any education on that. And therefore, um, um, I think there is definitely place for some intermediaries. And at the same time, uh, some who are educated enough do it on their own. And, and that, that's exactly, and I repeat myself now to the second time here, that's the new paradigm that society has to get used to. And, um, and leaving room for, for many different services, very specialized entities, institutions, and so on. So that's my closing remark. Thanks, Sven. 
Well, but I think that hits it pretty good because um, how do we close? There is a place for very, very many different business models in here. And I think everybody in this call is interested in doing business in the uh, in the blockchain sphere. Everybody in this call thinks that this, or uh, I don't know everybody who is listening, but I think that everybody from the speakers is convinced that a blockchain will be the next big thing or maybe even is already. Um, and uh, we are all looking very much forward to be uh, talking to the regulators. I think it's very great to see more and more regulators actually kind of like coming into these calls and uh, talking uh, talking to us. Uh, so this is great. And um, now there's, uh, I think, nothing more to add than uh, thank you for everybody participating. Thank you for the questions. And if there's any question that I have left out, please um, always make sure to kind of like come back to me on LinkedIn or hit the speakers directly. I'm sure that they will be uh, happy to answer any questions you guys might have. So thank, thank you. you. Thanks uh, to you, Sven, for the excellent moderation. I just made it back in time. Uh, we will continue with this webinar series uh, end of June. We will keep you announced about the dates and then it will be on industrial tokenization. Uh, we touched on this, of course, already. Uh, today, but there's a lot more to talk about. So thanks to everybody and the very insightful um, session we had this morning. Bye.